Hi, how's it going? Andrew here with another painting tutorial, and this week we're going to paint a little Italian street scene with a lot of texture and some depth given by linear perspective. Now this demonstration is going to be a little bit different. I'm working on a very small panel, about 8 by 12 inches, and I'm going to try and pack a lot of detail into a small area. Now as I mentioned, we're going to focus on linear perspective, and I'm really inspired by a recent trip that I took to Italy. Now I never considered painting a street scene before this trip to Italy, but there was so much amazing beauty going on within these streets that they just had to be painted. I found the architecture fascinating, and these intricate details in the buildings just impossible to resist. On my Italian trip I spent most of my time in Florence, just taking in the buildings and that light which had a profound impact on me. Now Florence was an amazing location, I was getting a lot of interesting ideas from walking around, but what I was really taken with was Siena. I took several reference photographs of this amazing little town. What I really loved were these arches, these doorways and openings that just seemed to draw the viewer in. These rough stone streets had some amazing details that would create an interesting problem to get around with paint. And these ancient textured brick walls I could just see impasto medium being used here to communicate some of this rough surface. I really like some of these curved streets and how the buildings weren't laid down in a rigid grid system. And some of these doorways with this weathered brick would make an interesting subject. And I knew somewhere within this painting I'd want to include a little destination for the viewer, and I thought this restaurant might make such a subject. So my goal here with this painting is to draw on this experience and create something with a lot of light in it, but a sense of depth that draws the viewer in. Now as I said, this is only going to be a little panel, 8 by 12 inches, so this is a lot of information to try and cram into such a small area. So to start off on the right track, I'm going to choose my favorite bit of reference material. It doesn't necessarily have all the elements that I love, but it's a starting point for me to be able to add those elements that I really like to this little scene. This one single piece of photographic reference is going to be the anchor for the painting. It's going to be my light reference, and it's also going to have some visual cues that will inform the texture in the buildings, as well as some of the perspective. I really like how we're looking down the street in this scene, and I can see a place to put that restaurant that I really like. So let's get started on this project, and we'll analyze the photograph in a little bit more detail. So here's my reference material, and I really love this photograph for a number of reasons. It's got a really nice narrow aspect to that street. The buildings look amazing with all of that texture, but I really love the light that's pouring in and casting shadows on the street, as well as the building over here on the left-hand side. There's also a nice warm glow to the building on the right. Now the first consideration when we're trying to do anything with perspective is working out where our horizon line lies. This is the horizontal, where everything above this line is going to dip downwards to meet it, and everything below the line is going to angle slightly upwards to meet it. It's the horizontal line that you can see running through here that matches that brickwork, nearly matches the windowsill, as well as some of the lines on the buildings on the right. Once I've established this line, I can then pick out some vanishing points. I've chosen one over here on the right. This seems to be the place where all of these lines for the building on the left seem to terminate. You notice the roof, the sills of the windows, and some of the aspects in the lower portion of the building all seem to line up and match this point on the right. 
Now, as usual, I'm not going to follow everything in this bit of photographic reference. I'm going to take some things out and I'm going to add some things in. This architectural detail that you see in the bottom left hand corner is not going to make it. I'm going to remove that. The balustrading in particular, I find a little bit distracting. As well as this detail here on the right hand side, I'm going to remove this too and open up the right hand portion of the little street. Now I'm going to choose another vanishing point at the corner of the windowsill here where these lines on the right hand side seem to vanish too. I've noticed that the roof line as well as some of the other lines amongst the windowsills and the gutter line seem to align to this point. Now they're slightly different of course than the building on the left which means that we're getting a little bit more of a funnel aspect to this painting already. The orientation of the buildings on the left and the right are slightly different. Now here's my palette, and I'm going to be mixing up some dark tone to sketch this in. But before we get into color, let's just look at all of the different materials I have here on the palette. I'm going to start here with oleo gel on the left. This is a great medium, will improve the flow and consistency of the paint. I have burnt umber, burnt sienna, nickel azo red gold, aerolide lemon, titanium white, pyrrol red, quinacridone magenta, deoxazine violet, ultramarine blue, cobalt teal, and phthalo green. And I'm sketching this directly onto my 8x12 linen panel with a bristle number two filbert brush. This is allowing me to get some short and sharp lines. Now remember, the most important line here is going to be this horizon line. So everything on the left is going to come up to meet that vanishing point as we discussed in the photographic reference. But to allow these lines to be a little bit straighter and to aim them correctly, I'm going to use the brush handle as a straight edge. I'm going to line it up with that point on the right hand side and draw these lines down to meet it. The same goes for these lines over here on the right. I'm going to line them up to a point on the left. Now it had been the windowsill in my photographic reference, but now I'm just going to use this point that I can aim for on the lead edge of that building on the left. Now we're starting to get that tunnel-like appearance here within the composition where our eye is being led in by these lines of perspective. Now one of the aspects that was not present in my photographic reference was an arch, and I just love some of these architectural details. I'm going to put one in. Now as an artist you can make decisions like this to just make the painting a little bit more interesting. It's about the painting at the end of the day, not about the photograph. Now every painting needs a destination or a central focal point. I think this little trattoria at the bottom of the street here would work really well as an inviting destination for the viewer. We want to travel down this street and have a spritz aperol at the bottom of the hill. Or a cappuccino, whatever's your thing. So the composition's sketched out and it's time to block in. So for this I'm using a combination of burnt umber and ultramarine blue to establish some dark tone. I'm going to add the slightest amount of deoxazine violet to give it a little bit of a violet tinge to work with some of those shadows. I'm going to block this scene in using a Rosemary & Co. Ivory Dagger. And you can find these brushes by following the link in the description below. So I'm manipulating and adjusting some of this dark tone with the slightest amount of burnt sienna, as well as ultramarine blue and titanium white. The goal here is to establish the darker tones first, and I'm going to leave some voids within this block in for the highlights. Now, as is the case with most of my paintings, I'm working with a formula of blocking in, modeling, and then detail. So this is a process of establishing the whole tonal dynamic and covering the entire canvas first, and then manipulating these layers over the top to get more of a sense of detail as we progress with the painting. It's really important for me to resist the temptation to go into too much detail too early. There's going to be a time for that detail. Now with some of these colors, you can see here that I'm just manipulating the pile of paint that's on my glass palette just a little bit at a time by just knocking and kicking tones around with slight adjustments in titanium white, ultramarine blue, and quinacridone magenta. Now the highlights here where the sun is striking the building, I'm going to leave slightly cool. And the reflected light that's showing on the undersides of some of these buildings and walls, I'm going to make these colors a little bit warm. Hopefully this gives me the illusion of heat sinking down into the scene from that open sky above through the space in the buildings. In the past I tried to communicate this direct sunlight as being a warm color. At midday the sunlight appears to be slightly cool. 
the direct light that is, that's hitting this building as well as the street below. By having this contrast between warm and cool, I'm hoping it's going to make it a much more dynamic and interesting painting. Now time to knock in these little windows here in this bridge. And already I'm getting the feeling that this bridge might be a little bit too low, but we'll see how it looks as I progress with this painting. Now for the marquee, for the roof on our little restaurant here at the bottom of the hill, I'm going to be using a short-handled ivory dagger. This is allowing me to get some really precise and sharp marks. And for this color, I'm going to be using plenty of ultramarine blue, a little bit of titanium white, but trying to keep that tone nice and dark. We want this to read as if it's in the shade down here at the bottom of the hill. Now during this block in stage, to make my life a little bit easier before I get into modeling, I'm going to knock in a few of the greens here that are going to be the foliage of some pot plants that are lining the edge of this little restaurant. Of course, they're probably going to be sitting in terracotta pots. So I'm going to get this color in here too, with a little bit of that nickel azo red gold and burnt sienna. One of the most important things though about this is just covering all of that background color and manipulating our edges so that it makes our life a little bit easier before we get into the modeling stage. I don't want any distracting marks or textures, so I go and flatten down some of my edges now in the blocking stage and smooth around some shapes. Now I've allowed the painting to dry for a day before carrying on with modeling. I don't really want to lift up any of that block in layer. This allows the strokes of color here in the modeling stage to be laid down easily. We need to increase the complexity of some of these tones and colors here on this brick wall and get a little bit of detail in and an indication as to where we're going to layer those really sharp details in the detail part of the process, the third stage. But as I'm increasing the complexity of some of this brickwork, what I'm doing is I'm adding slightly more titanium white as well as that pyrrole red and some of the burnt sienna and nickel azo red gold. I'm applying this with the edge of my brush with short and sharp marks and dragging the bristles in such a way that it fragments the strokes towards the edges. I just love some of the texture that I'm seeing here in this brickwork from the photographic reference. And I know I'm going to have to build this up layer by layer. So the gaps between the bricks I'm not paying any attention to right now. It's the overall tones that I'm seeing as patches of color. So again, the process here from the block end to the detail, we're starting off really, really general and working our way towards something specific. So here, this will be right in the middle stage of the process where I'm just starting to add a little bit more complexity to this wall. Now you can see that I'm contrasting some of these warmer gold colors with a violety blue color, paying attention to some complementary opposites. I want this wall here to sing with color from that reflected sunlight. Now that the block ends dry, I can establish where the lines of these windows are going to go with sharp marks given by that bristle dagger. Once I have these in place, I can then establish the green shade of these shutters. Of course, this color is going to be two different tones, one for the sunlight that's hitting the shutter, as well as one for the shadow area. I'm using a little bit of cobalt teal here and phthalo green, but plenty of titanium white in the highlight and a little bit of ultramarine blue in the shadow. At this stage, I'm not going too saturated with these greens. I'm going to save that saturation and intensity of color for my detail stage. And I'm going to work my way up to that ultimate saturation right at the end. So not only are we working our way towards ultimate saturation in our color, but also our tones. As the process progresses, I'm getting lighter and lighter with my tones, remembering to save my tonal best for last. I'm also working with texture, so the initial layers are going to be a little bit thinner in terms of texture. And then as I'm layering, I'm going to increase that tooth to the paint and get a little bit more impasto as the painting progresses. These colors that you're seeing here that are laid down in the bottom of the street are going to be a little bit cooler in the shadow and intense and light in that sunlight. Now the building on the right has lost those guidelines of perspective, so I need to reestablish those by using the handle of my brush and drafting these across with another ivory dagger. Once I sharpen this up, then I know where that detail has to go and those more precise lines of the brickwork along this building. And once I have these guides in place, it makes it easier to find the placement of these windows.
Hey, I'm really sorry to interrupt. We'll be back to the demo in just a minute. I had to let you know about something important. Have you subscribed through my website yet at andrewtischler.com? My subscribers get these videos 24 hours before they go on YouTube. As well as that, I send regular emails loaded with techniques and information to help you with your paintings. It's absolutely free. So follow the link in the description below or go to andrewtischler.com slash subscribe and sign up for my bonus newsletters. I look forward to seeing you over there soon. Thank you for letting me interrupt. Now back to the demo. Now I'm really having a good time here trying to work out what details I want to add to this painting. And I think what's needed down here in the bottom left is going to be maybe an urn or a giant vase or a pot of some description. I'm not too sure about the shape, but for now I'm just going to make it nice and tall around about hip height and something here just to catch the light and provide a little bit more interest in this area of the painting. Now these narrow Siena streets have got so much character, I can't just paint them with one monotonous zone of color. So I'm manipulating my levels of titanium white and ultramarine blue and burnt umber to make a nice dark gray tone. And then by adding more or less ultramarine blue, I can manipulate the cool that's coming through. For some warmer violet, I'm using a little bit of deoxazine violet and then balancing this out with cobalt teal. So you can see I'm starting to get a little bit of a mottled surface that will accept detail quite well. Once I have these marks in place, then I can go about making some sharper marks to separate between some of these stones. The perfect brush for this is a number zero synthetic round. It seems to find those grooves really nicely. And by just applying a few marks here and there, I can really get that texture down. Now with a little bit more heat and warmth over here with the buildings on the right, we need to get a bit of the glow from the street below to shine on this building. So I'm going to adjust and make that lead edge of the building a little bit sharper and this will separate it from the background. And already we're starting to establish a three-dimensional space where before these buildings had looked quite flat. This in combination with the lines of perspective are hopefully going to give us some sort of depth here within this little street scene. I need to check my perspective though to just make sure I'm on the right track and make sure everything's lining up to that vanishing point. Once I'm happy, then I can go about sharpening some of these lines. There's some really cool colors in these buildings within my photographic reference, and I want to try and communicate some of this alternation within the buildings here on the right. So I'm going to mix a cooler color, slightly cooler and darker than that warm yellow that's coming through. This is going to have a bit more burnt umber and some ultramarine in it with still plenty of that aerolide lemon and nickel azo red gold. I'm then going to apply this in a very patchy way. Now the technique is a little bit laborious, but by adding just one brick or one stone at a time, we begin to build up that texture and that illusion that this is masonry. If we lay it down in the correct way in terms of perspective and paying attention to our vanishing points, the effect can be really cool. But I've realized something. This arch has got to go. It's just not working with this painting. And this is one of the things that I love about painting, is some of these decisions that we have to make to make the painting better. I decide I'm going to lift it and open up this space here in the background. So first I need to establish the underside of the arch, and we're going to be seen underneath this thing, so it's going to have quite a deep shadow here as it curves upwards to meet the top edge of the painting. But that's also going to mean that this stuff that I've just painted is going to have to be wiped out to accept the next layer of paint without lifting any of that color and muddying my palette. So I'm going to use a clean cloth here and the, just the end of my finger to rub this out. It's a tough decision, but I think it will end up making a better painting. I have a feeling that this was the right decision because it's allowing more detail in that background to come through and have a little bit more of a destination for the viewer, which is going to allow for a little bit more of a sense of depth. It also means we're going to get to see some of those tiles of a little bit of a roof and sunlight here, as well as some sky poking through. I've decided to change the perspective of this building over here on the left and shift the vanishing point from here to here. This is going to make the angle of the street a little bit more extreme, and we're going to be sighting down the edge of this building here on the left which will provide a little bit more of an intimate space. 
This of course is also going to change the sunlight that's being cast down the side of that building. So I go about readjusting my lines and pointing at this corner of the window, which is the new vanishing point. Once I'm happy with this, I go back to work on that building and get a little bit more of that texture in there and establish where those windows are going to go. This time I'm going to use a synthetic Taclon round to establish the green color. Again, cobalt teal and thalo green with plenty of titanium white for those louvre windows in the sun. And then with a little bit of texture and alternating pink and yellow tones, we're going to get the masonry work that's in the sunlight here on the side. I want to establish plenty of texture here at this stage to be able to layer over the top, and this might indicate a little bit of that rough masonry in the sunlight. Also, by adding a little bit of texture here, we're going to have a physical lump that is going to cast a shadow as well as have a sharp and intense highlight, so I'm using the texture of the paint to mimic some of this masonry work. And now it's finally time for just a touch more detail here on the shadowed side of the building. And I'm using a small synthetic round number zero along with the number two filbert brush to knock in some of the darker color, allowing for some of that lighter underpainting to show through in the gaps. This will appear to be mortar showing between bricks. I can go back and reestablish some of those lines of mortar later on in the detail part of the process. But I guess we're edging up to that detail stage now, and sometimes the lines between modeling and detail are blurred with this type of painting. It's about just getting a little bit more complicated color out, some pyrrole red, some burnt sienna, and some burnt umber. This might be getting a little bit on the dark side of things, but I can go back and adjust with a little bit more gold and smush down some of those high points on the brush marks to make sure I don't have too much of a distraction there and make sure it's not too mottled. But you can see here, as I get a trimmed number zero round, I can go and work those fine lines of mortar down between those bricks and start to create the illusion of that masonry. Now again, I'm alternating some of these warmer colors with just a little bit of cool given by quinacridone magenta ultramarine blue and titanium white. I can then go back and add some darker marks again and just alternate and transition between light and dark, warm and cool. It's providing lots of interest here in this wall. What we're trying to achieve here is this effect of many different layers of texture and color of centuries worth of work that's gone on in these masonry walls. One of the things that I love about painting is this illusion of detail that you can create by just filling in a few little bits and pieces here and there. The viewer's brain will then fill in the rest of the detail. All we have to do as artists is just state a little bit well and they will complete the picture. So we don't need to paint each and every brick. Just a few will do. But here, maybe I'm getting a little bit over the top, but I'm certainly enjoying where this detail process is taking me. For these exposed bricks in the sun, we're gonna have a shadowed surface on the underside of bricks and an equal opposite highlight. So every time I lay down a shadow as a sharp line, I then make sure I go back and apply a sharp highlight. We're getting very close to pure titanium white here, and I'm also allowing a little bit of texture in that mark to come through. This in itself will catch a nice highlight. It's the alternation between this light and dark that is leading to this effect of texture. Now I've never spent 20 hours on an 8x12 painting before, but I certainly have here. So forgive me for skipping ahead a little bit on this little restaurant. But I just wanted to show you how far I went with some of the details here and applying a little bit of that extra touch with some glowing lights as well as some sharpness in the foliage. You can see the way that I'm applying the brush loaded with paint to just add one little mark at a time. I'll take the brush away every now and again to reload. I'm not expecting the brush to go too far with any one color. I'm continuously reloading that brush. Now we need a human element in this painting. So I'm going to have Nonna here shaking some ciabatta crumbs out of a tea towel as she's leaning out the window. 
Just this touch of life, I think, will add a little something else to the painting and make it appear a little bit more real. Incidentally, compositionally speaking, the lines of perspective are leading directly into this open window where we can see this figure coming out. This, I think, is going to add an enormous amount for such a small little detail. Now let's apply a little bit more texture here on the right-hand side buildings. As a general rule of thumb, for heavy masonry texture, I start off with some dark outlines and then work in the center between these dark outlines with some mid-tones. I try to alternate the mid-tones and have maybe two or three shades of color there to just provide enough interest. As I work these textures back and forth, more physical texture will appear and really give us the illusion that this is a rough surface catching light from multiple angles. Towards the tops of some of these bricks, it's going to be catching a cool tone from maybe some exposed sky above. And towards the bottom, that reflected street light is going to come up underneath some of these masonry stones. The sun is no longer shining down here in the bottom of the street, so I decided to do away with the market umbrella and simplify this zone. Also, this is a good opportunity to check my perspective and make sure that that detail I've applied on the masonry building is all lining up to the correct vanishing point. I have two different vanishing points now as I've decided to change the angles here on the right hand side. So I'm using this vanishing point here on the corner of the window where the figure is protruding out that window and another vanishing point here on the left hand side for the far right hand building. This change in angle I think will add just a little bit more interest to the scene and also reflect some of that sienna character where not everything lines up along the same grid pattern. Once I'm happy with my perspective I go right back to detailing, this time with some chunkier red brickwork just establishing those dark lines between the bricks and then adding some reflected lines from the light above, as well as some light marks for the exposed mortar between the bricks. I'm going to allow for some sharper detail to occupy these spaces closer to the viewer and bring this area forward. Sharp detail comes closer towards the foreground and less detail has the illusion of traveling further into the background. You can see with the accumulation of these sharp marks that we're really starting to communicate that texture. It's all about creating that illusion and just going slowly and steadily. Again, I save my tonal vest right towards the end of the process and we're gearing up towards that intense highlight that is showing on the left hand side here from that sunlight just spilling through the opening in the buildings. The first step to this though is to apply a little bit of that shadow. The shadows here are going to be nice and warm to communicate a little bit of reflected heat from opposing bricks. These are going to be applied again with the zero round. And once I've established the dark marks, you can see how the lighter highlights key right in there. I can alternate between a highlight brush and this mid-tone shadow brush to just increase the texture. The highlight that you see is a mixture of titanium white, nickel azo red gold, and aerolide lemon. This gives me a nice orangey yellow color for that highlight and some intensity and heat within that sunlight. The more titanium white I add to this though, the cooler it will go and I want just a little bit more cool to come through some of that sun as we were discussing earlier. So I'm going to save some of my warmth for whatever is reflected light. And this illusion of light is about having plenty of variation between our highest light tones and our deepest dark tones, as well as that variation of warm and cool. Now down here, some of these bricks are going to be very reflective indeed, and I'm going to allow a little bit more sharpness and a little more brightness to come through in these marks. And this is going to be nearly pure titanium white. And you can see just how far ahead of that opposing wall just behind where the figure is coming out that window, just how far that is coming forward. That contrast is everything to creating this illusion of space. A few final marks here on the cobblestone street and we need to get a little bit more texture coming through. I find those darker marks and I put a little highlight adjacent to the dark mark to increase the texture. A few cool highlights here on the shaded part of the wall 
and this will increase the difference and the contrast between that shade and that light but also give a continuation of a similar type of texture so there's continuity across the surface. Now you would have noticed that I don't use black but I can mix a near equivalent with adding burnt umber to ultramarine blue. This will make a really dark tone indeed and allow some of those dark marks to come further forward towards the viewer. If I apply these in a really sharp way like I'm doing here, it'll increase that sense of detail and focus right here in the foreground and allow these spaces to come closer towards the viewer. And with a couple of last minute touches here to this urn, the painting's finished. This has been a really fun project and something that's quite different for me. I never go to this level of detail, but I think for an 8x12 painting, it certainly has got a lot of information packed into it. My goal for this painting was simple. I wanted to create something that was inviting, to use linear perspective to draw the viewer in. This little painting was so much fun, and I look forward to doing more little street scenes just like it. Well, I really hope that you've enjoyed this video, and if you did, then please hit that like button for me. If you want to come back for more and see more tutorials just like this one, then make sure you're subscribed to this channel. As always, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook, but also make sure you're subscribed through my website at andrewtischler.com. I look forward to seeing you again soon. So long.